All right. Can you see it? Yes, there we go. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Sayurik, Sir and today we're gonna to talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, the proper use of runes um, within the, uh, the Viking Age proper, uh, which is generally reckoned between the raid on Lindisfarne Abbey in 793 and the defeat of Harald Hardrad at Stanford Bridge in 1066. Um, the reason I say the proper use of this rune set is that there are three or four that are floating around out there and this one only has 16 letters, uh, so people tend to shy away from it for use in English, even though it is actually the one that is correct for the Viking Age. Uh, next slide, please. So our objectives here, hang on a second. Uh, so our objectives here are to give the reference materials, transcribe an English phrase into a topic written conscription proper for the period 800 or 1100. That's why I asked you to bring some paper and pencil. Um, and, and in doing that, we're going to describe a little bit about the mythological origin of the runes, describe the origin of the term futhark, describe what an etter is, define and contrast voiced and unvoiced consonants, and that's kind of the, uh, the secret sauce to all this. Um, de describe entropy as it applies to written communications, which is kind of the other half of interpreting runes. And then demonstrate the use of alternate letters to show vo voiced and unvoiced variants, list the digraphs used in English and how to convey them as runes. More on that later. And then de define and contrast Galler and Seder, which is magic that might, uh, uh, from the period that might use runes. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So where did the runes come from? In reality, they were probably, most probably a Roman import. Um, Tacitus wrote extensively of his travels among the Germans in the first century um, and the, the way the, uh, the German war bands and war leaders, which by the way is where we get the terms duke and count from, um, from dux and comes, uh, the Latin terms that Tacitus used. And there was certainly a, a certain amount of inter intercultural interplay uh, between the uh, the the, uh, um, the Romans and the Gauls and the Romans and the Germans that moved some of those letters up. However, according to legend, uh, Odin, uh, the Allfather, hung himself on Yggdrasil, the world tree, for nine days and nine, nine nights, pierced by his own spear, Gungnir, a sacrifice up to himself from himself, and gazed into Erd's well, Erd being the, uh, the, the lord of fate, to gain the knowledge of the runes. He gave up an eye as a pledge to Mimer the wise, uh, the giant, to combine this knowledge with that of poetry, and then he hacked his head off um, and, and boiled it to make mead, so that he could use his head to uh, uh, answer questions, making an eye-flavored mead that could convey this gift. And that's why uh, mead is of often known as the, uh, the gift of poetry. Runes kind of fell out of favor in Scandinavia in the Christian era, which started around 1000 AD, depending on which country you're talking about. However, they were still used in some format until the 14th century, when there were other major changes to the languages that occurred. The, the runic letters Ev and Thorn um, are actually still in use today in Icelandic and in some of the other uh, Scandinavian languages. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So the Futhark, this is the 16 characters of the Futhark. They are split into three kinships or etter. Um, et etter basically means extended family uh, clan or something like that. Um, and they are known as Freya's etter, Heimdall's etter, and Tyr's etter from the first letter, a god with the, the name that starts with the first letter in each of, of the groups. The first one is where we get the, uh, the name for Futhark from, F-U-T-H-A-R-K, in much the same way that we get the word alphabet from Aleph Beth, which is the, uh, the old um, Aramaic letters that started based on the Greek. Um, the, uh, uh, the short twig Eastern runes that are used in Sweden, Estonia, Finland, and Latvia are very similar and they have the same letter. Uh, they are just a slightly different way of writing the same letters. But as you'll see here, not all the letters in English are represented. So and even not all the vowels in English are represented. So this sometimes causes some, uh, some challenges for people. Next slide, please. So this is, this is uh, uh, something I always throw out. If you want to really get into the nitty gritty and how this all works, uh, I believe it's Appendix C of the Return of the King explains the languages that Tolkien invented in particular the Elvish language. Um, and much like everything else that Tolkien wrote, he was heavily influenced by his 
Uh, his position as a chair uh, of Anglo-Saxon and Nordic Studies. And the way that he alternated the Elvish letters between voiced and unvoiced consonants, moving from dentals, labials, palatals, and gutturals, uh, was actually based on the way that rune sets are transcribed um, in, the, in the Nordic age, based more on the sound they make than on a proper diction or proper glossary. Um, so if you want to get a, a lot more into the details about what this voiced and unvoiced and, and, and philology means, that's a pretty good reference. Uh, like I said, because he basically lifted that to, uh, to, uh, to describe the, the, uh, um, the Elvish language. Um, but a little bit more on that later in a second. So next slide, please. So the next point is entropy in the written word. Um, do I have a volunteer from the group that would like to read the passage there at the top? It's a little easier to do in a classroom. But, but anyway, for those of you who are maybe old school programmers and recognize the lead speak, um, which has become sort of popular again these days, um, amazing things, impressive things. In the beginning, it was hard, but now on this line, your mind is reading it automatically without even thinking about it. Be proud. Only certain people can read this. Because the, the, not only do the numbers have a tendency to look like letters, but our minds are designed around immediately recognizing words based on fragmented uh, information. So we don't necessarily need to see every single language. And this is a concept called, from what's called uh, Shannon's um, information theory called entropy. The idea there is, is that when you're sending communication, how many bits do you really need to drop before someone doesn't know what you're saying? For any of you who've ever played around with uh, short rave radios or very old school radio communications, you know, know that everybody's talking and you're not really hearing the words clearly, but if, especially for the military, um, but you kind of know, expect to know what people are going to say. And from that, you can usually pull out the context of what the meaning actually is, even though you didn't literally hear it. And while that makes it sometimes difficult to, to read, uh, 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 read runes, um, uh, it, uh, it is unfortunately part of the, uh, uh, part of the, um, uh, the problem of being able to tr both transcribe and interpret runes. So an example was um, uh, of a high, high entropy language is English where we have, you know, quick, quack, quake. A low entropy language would be Q I C Q A K Q with a special long A K K. That in, on the on the left hand side, I can lose the C's, I can lose the U's, and I still know what the word says. On the other side, if I lose any of the letters, I don't know what it says anymore. Um, so that's an example of of high entropy. And since a lot of this was done in stone carving, they wanted to expend as little effort as possible for, for the letters that they wanted to transcribe. So they tended to use very low entropy. That was a question on there, like, how did I get interested in runes and what my background is? Um, well, I've been in the SCA for 30 some odd years. Um, I've always been kind of interested in Nordic stuff, quite honestly, from, from Tolkien. Uh, having watched the, uh, the animated uh, Hobbit back in 1976 when it came out on television, um, using all the same voice actors as the Christmas specials and the, uh, and, and the, um, uh, uh, um, the, uh, the Scooby-Doo show. So uh, Bard of Lake Town would have gotten away with it if it weren't for those darn kids. And Bomber the Dwarf was the Burgermeister Meister Burger. But, uh, oh, and also the voice of Disney's Haunted, Haunted House, if you've ever been there, um, Paul Fries. But anyway, um, uh, so how did I get interested in runes? Uh, I've been interested in languages uh, for a very long time. Uh, took a lot of foreign languages when I was in middle school and high school. Um, and this just kind of became a natural outcropping of it. Um, plus I'm, uh, I'm an engineer uh, professionally and have done a lot with uh, data and communication systems. So it's just interesting to me the way that things in the spoken language tend to, to mirror the same kind of concepts in, in data transmission. So it just sort of fed on each other. Mm. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, so those, are, those two concepts there are sort of important during understanding that. Um, so the, the entropy one, has anybody got any questions about how the entropy thing works? We're gonna get to some specific examples in a second. As far as the voiced and unvoiced, I probably should have gone over this at first. So examples are G and K. So if you, if you make the sound G and to make the sound K, you realize that your mouth is doing exactly the same thing. The only difference is whether or not your vocal cords are moving. 
Um, similarly, the sound t and the sound d and the sound b and the sound p for b and p, t and k, g and k, or sorry, t and d, g and k. Um, so what you see is that the sounds are really the same. And in, in, in a lot of these um, uh, northern Germanic dialects, even true today in high German, they don't necessarily differentiate between the voiced and the unvoiced uh, uh, sounds as hard as we do in English. Um, for example, those of you who have seen the spelling of my name and, and hear me introduced as Yorick, you wonder why there's no Ks in it. And that's because final Gs tend to be a hard K sound as spoken. Um, so similarly with the heart final Ds and, and final, uh, um, final Bs. Although it is interesting to point out that the only voiced letter that's represented in the uh, um, in the Futhark, as opposed to the unvoiced version, is actually B, and it looks just like a B. And the reason for that is that the letter B is infinitely more prominent in actual Norse words than the letter P is. It's not unheard of, but it's very rare, very much unlike English. Um, similarly, the the most common letters in uh, uh, common vowel in uh, Nordic words is probably uh, uh, the uh, long A and the O, uh, which is why it's so early in the list, as opposed to English, which the most common letter that's used is E. Um, next slide, please. So oh, as an aside, uh, uh, the uh, the prevalence of letters in uh, in in uh, English is roughly analogous to their to their value on playing Scrabble. So if it's a really rare letter like Z or X, it's uh, it's worth a lot of points. And if it's an easy letter like E, it's it's only worth one. So manipulating the runes when writing. Again, we talked about the voice and the unvoiced consonants. So the examples here are F and V. Again, if you that's a what's called a, a fricative, um, because you're blowing through your lips um, when you make the sound. And if you'll notice, do it to your, with yourself, the letter F and the letter V are exactly the same structure of your mouth. The only difference is whether or not your voice vocal cords work. The short TH, in, as in bath, um, which is the thorn, it kind of looks like a P with a, with a hat. Um, and then the long EV, um, as in bathe, um, looks like a D with a line through the top. Um, as an example, and then the K and G, which we talked about, T and D and B and P. Similarly, um, vowels are either made high in your mouth uh, in the back or low in your mouth in the front, and, and these can be paired as well. Um, so if you make the sound uh, like a U, um, you, you notice that it's way in the back of your throat. The alternate letter is O or A. Um, the, uh, the, the letter O in, in Norse is pronounced more or less like the A-U in caught. Um, so you notice that you're basically moving it forward in your mouth. Um, similarly, the, the, normal, uh, the normal letter a, uh, long A, I, um, is also the alternate letter U, uh, which is kind of like the U-E in uh, the umlaut in O. Um, it's kind of like the, the sound U-E it made in French. Um, but again, it's high in the mouth, low in the mouth. And then ah, as in father, and eh, um, kind of like Ethel red, um, is again in the front of the mouth and the back of the mouth, and i and y. Um, so the, uh, in, in Norse, the j's um, uh, have basically the same sound as y's, um, and it's kind of like the, uh, a, uh, an English y. So in English, there are also some digraphs um, that are not found in the, um, uh, the Norse language, uh, particularly SH and CH. Now, uh, sometimes if you're trying to transcribe English, I usually say you can do a rune digraph, uh, which is combining or bind runes, like SH and KH. Um, although technically speaking, in English, uh, th those, uh, the English accent for those um, actually comes from Yorkshire, um, which had that Norse inflection where the SH sound is the SK sound, which is why the, the English word ship in Norse is ski. And it's also why people who speak with a, a, a Southland English accent say things like schedule and chemistry, and why people in America and Yorkshire say schedule and chemistry. Um, and similarly, the, the English word church is the, is the Norse word Kirk. So if you wanted to try to quote unquote speak forsoothly with a Norse accent, 
uh, making your SHs sound like SKs and your and your uh, CHs sound with a hard sound like that is a good way of kind of slipping in that you quote unquote have a Norse accent. Um, the other thing that you see a lot of is those high entropy language letter combinations um, like NG and QU. Obviously, QU doesn't exist in Norse, so it's always a K. Um, but that, but basically, the 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 QU sound in English is 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 a K or a KW sound. So you can use a, either a K or or a bind rune to show that because there's no, not really a word cack. There's only the word quack, um, and and that's the thing is that there's not another word that you could mistake. You'll usually leave letters out. Um, so typically, when you're writing anything with a terminal NG in English, you can do it with a, with a uh, southern accent, swimming, fishing. Um, you can leave off the the uh, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the G um, or in Norse it was very common to leave off the N um, because there wasn't another word that that you could be confused. So if you couldn't confuse it, you could actually leave the letters out. So that's that makes it very difficult sometimes to transcribe actual runic inscriptions. You have to understand that not every letter is going to be there. It's kind of like the opposite of French, where every letter is there, but you don't pronounce it. Um, and we talked a little bit about ST, SK, double Ns, double Ls, double Rs. Double Ns, double Ls, and double Rs are very common in Norse words, but they were usually written with a single letter. So anytime you have the double letters like winning in English, you will generally only write one of the Ns because there is no word. Uh, 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 there's, a, there's a whining, um, but you can usually tell whether or not you're talking about whining or winning in context. So, uh, and, and, there's, and it's not really a hard and fixed rule. It's more of a more of a more of a set of guidelines, actually. So, so it's okay um, to to kind of free format as you're as you're playing around with it. The other thing that tends to be a little bit confusing is that there are two R's, and and when you see runes transcribed in English, you'll typically see one is a lowercase R, and then a second one that's a capitalized R at the end of the word. Um, and what that is an indicator in masculine uh, nouns, as in most languages, not English. Um, uh, Norse is a, uh, is a gendered inflected language, which gendered means that uh, all nouns and adjectives have a gender, which is either neuter, masculine, or feminine. Um, and the, the, the ending of the noun changes depending on how it is used in the sentence. Um, for those of you who have learned um, uh, other languages, particularly Latin or German, um, uh, they have what are called declensions. Um, so the more common ones are nominative, uh, which is when it's used as the subject of a sentence. Um, accusative, uh, which tends to be the direct object um, or something that is, uh, 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 is performing an action. The dative, uh, which is the indirect object or the receiver of an action, and then the genitive, which is similar to the apostrophe as possessive in English. Um, so, for example, the word hester, which means horse, hester is the nominative, hest is the accusative, heste is the, uh, the dative, and hests is the genitive. Um, so, when you see uh, uh, a name like hurifer, that is the nominative form of my name, um, ending in that capital R, which is the one that looks like a little bit like a chicken foot. Um, the other R looks like an English R. And so, for example, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog, or the fox gave the ball to the hound, the fox's ball is in the hound's mouth, or the fox is not a dog. Everything in bold there is in the nominative case. All the other nouns are in some other case. Um, so. That's a bit of a fire hose. I'm gonna stop and see if there's any questions on that one. Because, because uh, as I said, that doesn't really apply in English, but that's why that is the way it is. So you would really only ever use that second R if you're using the proper Norse name as the object of a sentence. Okay, and next slide, please. So, where do we have uh, most of uh, what we know about runes? Well, there is a 13th century manuscript, which was a, which is a um, copy of a number of 10th century poems called the Codex Runicus, which actually gives us a little bit of our Rosetta Stone. But there are also an awful lot of rune stones from the period. Um, the more famous ones being the Gotland rune, rune stones, as well as the Yelling rune stones. So this kind of gives you an example of the jump from 
what does it literally say in runic to what did it say in Norse? So you see the Rathlisil Aug Fairborn Aug Kundborn, which is really Rathlisil Aug Fairborn Aug Gindborn in Norse. So you can see that some of the letters have been left out and those voiced and unvoiced consonants have been swapped. Um, and so it's not exactly the same, but it's close. Um, next slide, please. So the other thing that complicates the use of runes and interpreting runes is the use of kennings, culture, and context. As I was saying, like, you know, even though the word winning and whining is very similar and you did it phonetically, you may, they may look the same. You can generally tell from the context of the sentence which word you actually intended. That is extraordinarily common in trying to interpret runes. A, a, a lot of, the way to say it is that things were not written down for the purposes of communicating to far unknown people in the very future. Things were written down because words had power and by reminding yourself about things that you already generally kind of understood that you could convey that power. Um, uh, this this uh, picture is from my favorite episode of The Next Generation, um, Darmok and Jalada Tanagra, um, featuring Paul Winfield, who is also the uh, captain of the Reliant from Star Trek II. Um, anyway, the idea there was is that this, this alien species woke entirely, spoke entirely in terms of idioms from their cultural stories, and Picard was unable to communicate with them until he was able to t retell the uh, story of Gilgamesh and relate it back to the story of, of, of uh, Darmok and Jalad. Um, so that, that notion of cultural context is very important because there'll be a lot of sidehand references to the gods or the relationships of the gods or ancient stories or even ancient events um, in, that you have to have a decent understanding of sometimes to be able to understand what it is that people are trying to say to you. Next one, please. So here's another famous runestone, the Yelling runestone. Yelling was the... Uh, um, was the uh, ancient uh, uh, Christian capital of Denmark um, from the uh, about the 980s. Um, the, the original pagan uh, capital was originally an Odense, which means Odin's town, which was then moved to Roskilde, um, which is near Copenhagen. Um, great place, awesome Viking ship museum there if you ever get the chance to go. I love that place, I've been there a couple of times. So anyway, the, 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 the Yelling Runestone was raised by Harold Bluetooth, which by the way is the origin of Bluetooth, which is why it's a BT bind room, um, to his parents. And so, so this says, Haralter, Kanukar, you know, Bath, Karua, Kubel, you know, and you'll see that again, that's not exactly what it was really supposed to say. At the bottom there is actually the literal translation of what it says. Harold, Harold King uh, made, this, uh, um, made this place after his, uh, Gorm, his father, and after Thera, his mother, um, and Harold, um, as he became uh, uh, king through victory, or sorry, king through fighting of all Norway. Um, so anyway, this, this stone is still there. Um, it's, it's kind of a, an important, uh, important cultural artifact of Denmark as the current crowns of Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, and many of the royal family of England and Germany um, are actually all related to Harold Bluetooth um, still, and, and the, the kings of Denmark still in direct lineage um, has, has been going on now for almost 1100 years. Next slide, please. So use of runes every day. Um, even though they are closely associated with magic, they were not only used for magic, as in uh, there were a large number of people who actually had a certain level of literacy. Um, we have found tons and tons of personal items like combs and things like, you know, Kimball made a good comb or, uh, you know, uh, Kettle uh, gave this comb to me or things like that. Um, cipher boxes, uh, which some, some fortunately sometimes are still uncipherable um, and they contain all kinds of fragments that were you know, used for who, who knows what. Uh, little scraps and memos like, hey, remind me to get my five gold pieces from this guy. Um, and then there was actually, uh, in particular, merchants. Um, you would think of guys who spent a lot of time on ships as being nothing but a bunch of axe-wielding raiders, but in fact, they were all generally up on law codes because of trading. And they were also tended to be fairly literate um, in, in so far as they were able to uh, be able to transcribe contracts and, and read, the, read local agreements. And a lot of merchants would use these little wooden 
tags, which were basically their label. Um, they were carved in sp ways specific to the merchant and, and, and had runes with their name on it or some kind of a brand name basically for their business. Uh, and we found a lot of these things tied to all kinds of things, everything from uh, brass bar stock uh, to swords, um, to boxes and things like that, furs, um, things that would be uh, part of the, of the trade. Uh, the way that I put it is that the Viking Age that is sort of come down to us as the whole smash and grab really actually only listed, lasted for about uh, 60 years. And that was from uh, 800 to 860 or thereabouts. Um, everything after that was mostly a combination of colonialism, uh, exploration, and commerce in a time where there really wasn't a rule of law. Um, the way, think of it as most Viking crews were probably an awful lot like the Serenity from Firefly. They were really just trying to make a living, but it seems like fighting broke out an awful lot. Um, that's probably a good way to think about what the actual practical life of a Viking was after about 860. Next slide, please. And then a, a little bit on runes and Viking magic. Um, there are two types of Viking magic. Um, there is Galdr and Sather. Galdr is the masculine aspect. Uh, it tends to be focused on chants and incantations um, and the uh, granting of protection, destruction, child rearing, things like that. Um, this is actually the magic that used runes. So you, would, you could carve a rune in a... Um, in a in a in a uh, in a stick or on a tree um, to to as a ward against something or as a as an early warning system or as a prayer for something, um, and that was that was where where rune magic was used. I know a lot of times I'll see like oh bring out the you know the the angel of death oh she's going to cast the runes that wasn't actually part of the female aspect which is satyr. Sather is uh, associated with visions and trances. Um, it was really fo focused on uh, behavioral modification and prophecy through divination. Um, kind of the idea is that there is an unseen world and you could get it to do things for you. And Sather was about trying to figure out when things were going to happen so that they lined up with what you were trying to get done. Um, I, I put an ash and an elm on there because those are trees that were uh, representative of that masculine and feminine um, magic um, uh, accordingly. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the, the last thing here is I want to make, uh, you've uh, probably heard of these things called Galderstaffer, which basically means wizard's runes or wizard staves. Um, they are mentioned in the sagas, which are 14th century documents. There are instructions, the last 18 stanzas of Havamal, the, the sayings of Har or Odin, um, which is a 9th century poem. It comes down to us um, from a, a 13th century manuscript, but we are almost positive that the, the poem itself was actually described in the 9th century. Um, unfortunately, those instructions tell you what the, what the rune casts do. They don't actually necessarily tell us what the spells are. They certainly don't tell which runes they're referring to. Um, although they are written in, in the poetic meter called Galdrlag, which means they might actually be the spell, but we don't really know. Um, they are depicted in an 18th century uh, book called the Holda or Hidden Manuscript. Um, this was a time of sort of uh, romantic nationalism in Iceland um, where they were trying to basically build a functioning religion around some of those older stories. So you'll hear about the Igishjalmer, the Helm of Awe, and the Vegviser, or, or uh, the, the, way, the, the, the vision of the way is what it translates literally, or compass. Um, these are very commonly used throughout uh, the neo-pagan and the reenactment groups. Um, you know, because they, they kind of have a lot of cachet, but, and, and the, the, the terms themselves are, are mentioned in some of those 14th century sagas, but nobody actually knows what they look like. These representations are actually from the 18th century. Last slide, please. And I just want to kind of uh, leave off on this. Uh, there is a, uh, there is one thing that's fairly well described in a number of sagas, that's the Nistang um, curse. Um, Nith is, uh, um, you could kind of describe it as evil or criminal. Um, it's also a curse. 
Um, so when you declare somebody myth, you're putting a curse on them, saying that they are outcasts from society. Um, in the Icelandic parliament, if you did something that you weren't able to pay back or did some, you know, killed too many people, um, they might declare you a, a, a nith. Um, if you killed somebody and fessed up to it within three miles of it happening, you were guilty of mandra or manslaughter, which actually means uh, manstrike. Um, if, you, if you mutilated the corpse by A, throwing it in water where somebody had to get their hair wet to go fetch it, B, going more than three miles from where the act happened, or C, hacking their head off and putting it on a fence post, um, or D, lying about it, then you were guilty of a, of, um, a nithok or a fell strike. Um, and, and that was sentenced with either death or, uh, or immediate outlawry, which meant you, meant you lost all of your civil rights and rights to trial, which generally meant that you ended up having to leave. Um, so this uh, horse's skin uh, with the skull and hooves still in would be draped over a pole with runes and curses carved into it in the direction of the person who you wanted to make this uh, curse against. Um, the, the guy who I patterned a lot of my persona on, Eglis Gallagrimson, uh, made one of these against his, his, his foe, Eric Bloodaxe, the king of the Kingdom of York, um, in the mid-10th century. Um, and uh, as an example, um, it's described pretty well in his saga. So that's, I believe, the last thing. Are there any questions? There is a question here in the chat that says, could you please give us your background and how you became proficient in wings in Norse? Poor <laughs> Um uh, Yeah, you know, again, and as I, I, I pointed that one out before, so uh, um, I, I've been in the SCA for 30 some odd years, kind of lurking for almost 40 now. Um, uh, I, I kind of introduced to Viking things through, uh, through Tolkien back in the 70s. Um, and it just kind of took off from that. Um, uh, um, I tend to delve pretty deeply into rabbit holes on, on something when I learn something about it. And so I, I taught myself Icelandic while I was on deployment in the Navy. Um, and I'm actually in the process of going back and uh, doing some translations of Old Norse now um, to get a little bit more fluent with the language. Um, is the ma merchant labels the same or similar to a maker's mark? Uh, yes, it's the same concept, except that it wasn't necessarily hammered into the into the uh, object the same way that uh, um, a maker's mark usually is. It was more or less, um, it was a tag. It was basically a tag and a label, uh, just like a modern one. Um, hello from late, uh, in Belt. hello to you as well. Are there any other questions? Cool, I think I, I'll give you eight minutes of your life back. Thank you very much for everybody for coming.